So I'm sort of continue. I'll continue in the same uh, vein as Alanka uh, and Nathanael and Bharato, and sort of focus on the practical aspects of what's happening in HPC and how we need to adapt. Okay, so you know they started with uh, uh, with a little more of how do you write a computing proposal and things like that. I'll be actually doing a it's overall bigger picture survey of what's happening in HPC and how the astrophysics community is adapting to it, especially on the HPC, you know, on the uh, numerical simulation side. So there's a lot also happening on other fronts. For example, you know, in data, there's like there are these big observatories which are gathering you know, terabytes and petabytes of data every so often. So that's totally different thing. I'm not going to talk about that. But it also involves HPC and other aspects of HPC. I'm going to talk about the uh, solving PDE aspects. Right? That's what my, my expertise is. Okay. Well, let's get started. So you, you, this is a recap from the first day. Uh, so just to sort of set the stage again for you, just refresh your memory. Uh, we learned that the clock speeds are saturated. You know, this is this has happened like ten years ago. You won't get four gigahertz in the heaven. That's done deep. Okay, so you have so before, like when I was in that student, uh, essentially at that time, the the parallel codes were not that common. You know. There were niche people who were using parallel code. Normal people were not did not have to deal. But now it has become extremely commonplace uh, because the clock clock speeds have saturated. And uh, Argo in his first talk talked about all these. Uh, uh, Argo in his first talk talked about these architecture level uh, parallelism. Like you know, you can fetch the instruction. You can decode the instruction, run, you know, add the number, so on. All these things can be done in parallel with the process. So it was always that which draw the computer revolution. But the next steps, you know, and he talked about cache, increasing cache hits, pre-fetching, and so on. So these are all architecture level single processor tricks that were done to get performance earlier. Okay, now the multi multi-cores game. Multiple cores uh, uh, on a processor came, and that was the end of software's pre lunch. In the sense that you know now the responsibility is on the software developer to use the capability that's there in your system. I mean, that's why the you know it's end of free lunch. This is what the meaning is. Okay. So now the programmer must write parallel pro code to explore the hardware. MPI was talked about, OpenMP was talked about for shared memory issues like load balancing. You know, the world should be uniformly distributed so that you can get to the end as quickly as possible. Uh, and then we learned about this AMDOS law. Again, to me, this weak scaling, strong scaling sort of boils down to this that even if you have a tiny part of your code which is sequential, you cannot scale beyond a certain limit. Okay, so you want to really get rid of sequential portions of your code. Uh, then we heard about the rise of the GPUs, and that's what going to happen. This is the next advance. So the multi cores was the first advance in about uh, late 2000, around 20, 2008, 2010. That's when almost everything become you had many cores on your processors. Now the next Thing which has already happened actually uh, is the rise of GPUs, this uh, single instruction multi threading, you know, massive uh, concurrence. You can do a lot of similar things together on a large scale that has come in, and we should be able to use it. And we also heard that GPUs don't exist alone, they always come with the CPUs. So, this is what is heterogeneous uh, architecture. So there is more uh, demand 
from the software developers that you have to be able to use all this. So you cannot just be blind and just press the button and be, you know, be done with it. It's not that you have to do. Okay. And the programs, because of that, have become more complex. Okay. And what it means is now almost everyone who does code development for such heterogeneous systems have to rely on multidisciplinary people, you know, software people, uh, people who have huge coding experience in their teams, whose job is just to provide these tools so that you can use them while going to this next frontier. So this is going to be important. So you know, we learned about CUDA, OpenCL, OpenACC, but these are not the only approaches. There are others that I'm going to briefly touch upon. So there are actually quite a lot of work and there are lots of signals. There are rewards to you. Suppose you have shown that your code scales on more than a million hours. No program committee will stop you from getting time on any of these big machines. So that's the reward you get. You get, you know, you get to do the biggest. Okay, so we have to be ready. So yeah, the, the Indian context is lagging behind, but you know things can, things are changing rapidly. You if you know if you start learning today, we are ready. If you, if you don't start learning today, and the change comes, and you know we are just wasting our resources. Okay, and now things have become so. Uh, uh, things are become so border independent, like you heard. Uh, you know, there's a lot of computing time in Germany. This has a lot of computing time in Australia. So, you know, you have any way to learn all these uh, things. The other thing is that the power consumption. Now, now the biggest supercomputers have a power plant locally to supply the power to running to run the supercomputer. That's true here also in Param Pravega. We have a local power supply. You know, it produces power just for that. So, uh, so basically, these things, the power inspiration and hunger for more number crunching, will make these heterogeneous systems. All systems will be heterogeneous with CPUs and GPUs or, or accelerators of some sort. Okay, so, uh, so this is. Something that's quite interesting, just if you're online, just type this top500.org and check this out. This is, uh, this, I think it was mentioned previously as well. So this is a list of, you know, basically this is an exercise that was started in, uh, let's see, I've written it here. So 1993, people said that every six months, you know, release a list of, of 500 Computers, super computers in the world. Because of these lists are because every six months and there's a big, uh, you know, there's a big competition for systems to be there somewhere. Okay, so you get funding from the government in a way. It's a very visible event. So if you have a full cluster, you always try to get there if possible. Okay, so this is a bit of a history. The website is actually extremely nice. Beautiful website. You know, there's a lot of uh, statistics, a lot of information. Uh, I'll actually show some of that. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> so this list has been compiled every, twice a year, starting from June 1993, with the help of HPC experts, computational scientists, manufacturers, and the internet community who have responded to questionnaires we send out. They said, no, who are the likely players of this and how to run tests and give their numbers uh, for performance. In the present list, which we call top 500, with this computer is ranked by the performance on Linpack benchmark. So this is a standard benchmark. So you you want to run the same test that's run on all these systems so that you can actually compare apples to apples. So this is this Linpack uh, benchmark. The Linpack benchmark solves a dense system of linear equations. Basically, matrix equation AX equals B, where A is a dense matrix. It's not a sparse matrix. So it's an order N cubed. You know, so solving AX equal to B, if the size of the matrix is N by N, is an order N cube operation. It's a very expensive operation. Uh, and it's a very common operation as well. So that's why, you know, almost every application uses matrices. 
So, uh, or linear solving linear systems. So, this is why it's very popular benchmark. That does not mean, so for example, they themselves say this performance does not reflect the overall performance of a given system as no single number can ever be. Because there are different applications, not all applications are matrix solves. Okay. So, this is how the web page looks like. So, this is the list. Uh, the present list and the, the number one there saying so, you know, if you have a computer is you know just open this so I just put this copy paste it on my slides so the first one there is uh, Frontier this is at Oak Ridge National Lab in the US and so the, you can actually see this is the rank the system name number of cores uh, R max R B so the maximum theoretical uh, Props, number of floating point operations per second. And this is uh, what it shows in practice. So, this is just by num multiplying these theoretical numbers, the clock speed, number of operations per cycle, and so on. Okay. The last thing has become extremely important, which is power consumption. So, this you can actually see the frontier has 22 megawatt power consumption. That's like huge. Okay. In fact, uh, Frontier is one of the more efficient, energy efficient systems out there. The second there is the Japanese supercomputer Fugaku. So, you know, the, yeah, we, we learned a little more about Frontier, but you know, this actually has what sort of a system is it? It's HP Cray, HP Cray ES235A with AMD optimized third generation EQI C44C. Uh, and the processor name, speeds, two gigahertz, uh, and so on. So this is a, this is a uh, this is an accelerator. This is an AMD accelerator, like a GPU. So this is a high uh, machine. This is actually a pure CPU machine. What it means is it's not a, not going to last there for a long time. It's going to get kicked out from there very soon because the GPUs are where the explosion is. Uh, yesterday in Andrea's talk, he showed this Leonardo, which is in Italy. So he, so he was telling, telling us about these eight sort of astro codes, which will be sort of given a chance to you know, show off their skills and you know that they can develop codes for exact scale. This is that system. Summit is another US system. <clears throat> um, this is there are four entries from India as well. In the top 500, the first one is something called and our, this is in uh, CTAG. Okay. Uh, the other one is Param, Param, one of the Param computers. Uh, Param Siddhi AI, which is also at CTAG. And then there is Pratyush, which is a weather forecast uh, application at Institute of Tropical Meteorology. And the, the material is also for better prediction. So these are the four systems that we have there. As uh, Sadish was mentioning, ours is the top academic institute uh, supercomputer. So all these are like uh, these are not academic institutes per se. Okay. Um, so this is where there's more information about Frontier, which I want to show. So Frontier is this the top. Uh, so we could shoot in that list. This is Frontier's web page. Okay. So this is Exascale is the next level of computing performance by solving calculations five times faster than today's top supercomputer, exceeding 10 to the 18 calculations per second. Uh, Frontier will enable scientists to develop new te technologies for energy medicine and materials. Okay. And they have like really beautiful uh, Okay, so these so this kind of big impact comes here. Here is a part of it, especially Amitabha Bhattacharji, who is, is, is at the Princeton Plaza Physics Lab. So he has sort of gotten entirely access to this system and sort of run it for problems. And this is basically, this is plasma physics. This is materials at exascale. Uh, so there are more. Uh, so it's sort of related to energy combustion. Then the next application is manufacturing. And then 
This is cosmological Salman Habib, cosmological simulations, uh, end body simulations. And so this is another astro. So you can just think that there are already three, four astro applications. So that astrophysics actually is a big player in HPC worldwide. Okay, because it's it's very hungry for you know doing these big uh, creations. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. First, thanks. Okay, so this, these are some statistics. This is Wendell system share. Okay, so anyway, it's a lot of beautiful data, but these are pie charts. So you see, it's in the top. So this is Wendell system share. System means there are 500 systems in the midst. Okay, what fraction of system? Is supplied by what vendor? So you see, the biggest one is still Lenovo. This is uh, HP Enterprise, Hewlett Packard, HP. Pay HP. Uh, there's, a, there's a bigger, big chunk. This 10% is Kato's, uh, and so on. So, for example, this Param Pramega is uh, Kato's and HP together. I've answered it some other. So, uh, so this is the vendor share. So, this is performance share. Performance share means out of all the federal products that you receive, those system company crops comes from which vendor. So, these are, you for everything you'll have these two. Performance here and the system. System just counts the number of systems. This is better flow fraction. Okay, now what is this? This is countries and system share. So the US is green. So in the middle, like earlier, before this existing push from the US, China had become really a big part of this pie. Now this exascale uh, sort of push in the US has put them again in the leading position. So now US is one, China is two, and no, this is general. Uh, no, this is Japan. Japan is also very big. Yeah, Germany and so on. Okay. So again, this is system share and performance share. Awesome. This is how data should be presented. There's no need for speaking much if you have a beautiful visualization. Now these are something called tree maps. So you see, this is this is again vendors. This is those are this list June 2020. You can, you know, this is a drop down. You can actually see the same thing in Thomas from 1993. So, so, this is HPV. This is the biggest cluster, right? Uh, this uh, frontier, right over in there. And then this is another one done by HPE. This is Fugaku, which is Fujitsu cluster. And there are these little Fujitsu clusters in top 500. Another way of showing data usefully and so on. So, you can, you should check this out. It's really nice. Then there is something, so there is a statistics uh, bar there, and then there are like various kinds, you can know, try charts, and list, sub list, and so on. So this is sub list generator. So this is, you know, here you can actually check if you just select top 500 from all segments, all countries, and so on, you just give the main top 500 list. And then you can see, oh, look, top 500 from, say, China or India. <laughs> yeah. Whatever ranking in that country. Uh, and this is a clean 500 list. So, top 500 according to the power consumption. So, how uh, largest petaflops per, uh, this is gigaflops per watts. So, you get maximum drops per power. So, this is a system called Henry. Uh, which is in the US at, at Front Island Institute, which is in New York. Okay, it's a smaller cluster, it has only 8,200 cores, uh, but it is still there in top 500, 255 rank. So, you know, there are different kinds of clusters out there. Now, Frontier is here, it's even in the green list, but its performance for uh, power consumption it is not at number six here. So that means this is going to have a it will last there for a long time. Okay, so that's why it's a, it's a big deal. And there are other systems here. Uh, this Frontier TDS is like a smaller version of Frontier at Oak Ridge. Okay, 
So this is another data. And this is another stuff that's quite fun there. This is time. It's from 2012, but you can actually essentially do whatever that time you want. So this is countries. Uh, System share number of systems in top 500 as a function of time. So I, I think there are every year there are two data there. So, so, okay. so this is 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, so you see this is shrinking. What is this? This is United States. The United States was the US was the big player in HPC, but its share is slowly going down. It is sort of picked up again. This thing has grown as China, of course, and so on. India is really small thing like this. Oh, uh, what's this? This is again randomness. This is other ways. Most of these are made by different companies. Most of these systems in top 500, there is no monopoly here. Okay, but there is like large players. What is this? This is HPE, HP Enterprise, which I showed this uh, frontier with an HP installed system. This is another data that I got from there. This is the exercise time here. And this is performance. Okay, so this is sum all the flops of all the 500 computers there. So the green, it starts from one teraflops per second. And so one teraflop is 10 to the 12 calculations per second of all those 500 computers combined in 1990. Okay, so now this has reached like uh, here, combined performance. This is the top performer. This triangle is number one in that list. So it's sort of moving along. It's sort of saturated. So the saturation means that the same system dominated for a long time. Right? These flat parts. So when I was a PhD student, you know, there was a lot of fear. The Earth Simulator of Japan had to be like the biggest. Uh, HPC uh, machine and it lasted there for a long time. So I think it's this uh, here. And this is the smallest one on that list. Okay, beautiful way of showing data. This is this is showing how accelerators have become very very important in these big machines. This is not from top 500. I could not find this easily. So I'm making my talk today because I didn't really have much time, but I knew what I want to find. Uh, so uh, this shows here and only from 2006 to 15. So there were no GPUs or I mean, there were GPUs, but they were sort of limited to gaming stuff. And then slowly they started becoming more and more and more important. And there are all flavors of these accelerators. You know, NVIDIA has it, AMD has it, Intel has it. In all companies, none of them want to miss out on this next big thing. So, you know, uh, accelerators or hybrid architectures are there to say this is the next big thing. Okay, so this top 500 uh, thing also sort of has this highlight. I will just copy it. You know, on the main page, if you look at the right, it has highlights. It just tells in green about the top system. Okay, so Sandian is the number one system in top 500. This is a unique system in the first, uh, it's the first US system with performance exceeding one exaflop. So this is the only system which actually formally exceeds an exaflop. It is at ORNL uh, in Tennessee, and it is operated for DOE, Department of Energy. That's why you saw all those PIs on that uh, frontier page, they are from DOE institutes, because there's their machine in some sense, but it's a big, big uh, uh, DOE has a lot of diverse uh, labs and people you know, are running at that stage. Now, second number, so okay, so let's see what else. It is, it is currently achieved 1.194 exaflops per second using 8.7 million cores. I mean, this, <laughs> this is like a huge number 8.7 million cores. and the HPE Cray EX architecture combines third generation the CPUs and the AMD Instinct 250X accelerators. You know, these are just the specific names of those, but it has CPUs plus accelerator. And then Slingshot 11 interconnect. So, all these machines, all these things, nodes, 
Also, I have to be connected to each other to pass dates. This is this their own custom infinity. Uh, you may have heard of infinity band uh, and other like uh, gigabit and uh, ethernet and so on. So this is this is an inter interconnect. This is also an extremely important part of your specs of an HPC system. Ogaku is installed in Raiken Center for Computational Sciences in Kobe, Japan. It has about 7.6 million cores and it has achieved these many clocks per second and so on. So Leonardo is the one that Andrea was talking about. Uh, this is in uh, Italy, in the Geneca. Uh, this is also a hybrid machine, Xeon Platinum 2.6 gigahertz main process and NVIDIA X accelerators, the MP100, A100. Uh, so this is, this does not have accelerators, but everyone else on that list in top 10 is being an Okay, now, so switching gears now. Okay, so that was about the HPC scene and all this trends. So now we're coming to the Astro scene, especially the Astro scene as applied to solid PD in the ash. Okay, so actually the, the astronomy community is actually quite lucky in the sense that we have a lot of open source codes out there, right? That, you know, people can, can just download and start using like Pluto uh, and others. So this is out of a list of popular astrophysical codes. So this table was actually prepared for a document that I, Harvey and others have sort of gave an overview of the Indian HPC astro scene. Uh, so these are the codes Pluto, Flash, Athena, Plus Plus, EU, Lag, MHD. These are all like solving Hydro, MHD. These are the application areas. These are all higher order golden law methods, right? Which we talked about golden law methods in quite detail. But these popular codes are all based on that. Then there is Gadget, Volker Springer's Gadget code, which is really pop, which was actually not that much anymore. It was very popular in Crystallological galaxy formation. Uh, this is based on SPH or smooth particle microdynamics. And then there is Arifo. This is the new version, new, not new version. This is the new code that Folker and the MPA group have come out with. Uh, <clears throat> and it essentially does, you know, it's mainly useful for cosmological galaxy formation applications. And this is a moving mesh code. As I mentioned in, in my talk earlier, that most of the astrophysical uh, cores use just simple uh, grids like Cartesian, spherical, cylindrical, but this uses a moving mesh, a horonoid uh, designation of space, and the mesh is from pinpoint, so you have to generate the mesh again and again. So, so what I said on uh, Monday is does not apply everywhere. So this is also uh, an important code. Then there is pencil code, which is a finite reference code. Uh, uh, around sort of a little nature of one's new stores, uh, Axel Brandenburg and Cochrane. Yeah. And then there are these black holes, you know, GR code, GR MHD, and uh, you know, numerical relativity codes. Okay. And you know, these are based on different methods. So this table will be useful. Now, so I'll give you a little history of this. And it's of course a biased history because I, you know, I'll I only know this much. Uh, from my experience, and you know, the earlier, like you know, in sixties and so on, people you know wrote their own code, ran it on their processors, and published papers that used by next generation people, and more or less, uh, that was it. So everyone wrote their own code for everything. Companies. It was almost like that. And you had two D codes. You know, a lot of study work was one D, two D, fifty was not available. The first widely popular code. Which is adopted, which is open and widely used by the astronomical community, was the Zeus code. In fact, I started my uh, PhD, I did my PhD work based on Zeus code. Uh, so it's a finite difference code, which sort of in 1990s came out as a 2D version, and then there were three versions and uh, so on. It was not parallel to begin with, but it was parallel with using message passing interface NPI. In around 2000, there were like multiple versions of this code spreading uh, in the community, but there were proper code releases, one or two using NPI as well. 
So this is sort of like early history as well as I, you know, as well as my experience goes. So then, uh, yeah. so then, so Zeus, Zeus was developed by Jim Stone and uh, Mike Norton. And Z, you know, Jim's other sort of very popular code, more recent one, uh, is this Athena family of codes. Uh, and yesterday, when we asked Andrea about the origin of Neptuno, he said, you know, there were these big short codes named after the Greek gods. And, you know, I thought I'd just start with something for Rumbu. But eventually, we discovered that Rumbu also refers to a Greek god. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, uh, so then this Athena was written in C. Athena plus plus came with C plus plus. The C plus plus provides you with more internal infrastructure. What you're talking to, you know, a lot of things that are done easily in C and not in C. Just like early codes used to be important, so people, a lot of people moved to C because it was provided more uh, power and flexibility. Uh, and now, so Athena, which was in C to Athena, plus plus, so now there are like a bunch of uh, sort of uh, branches from Athena, plus plus. Break down the team of Tia, Sina, PKK, Tina, what he gearing towards uh, something called performance support and which you want to write a code, but it should be able to run on accelerators, CPUs, everything. So that's the approach that they have taken that uh, somehow they'll use uh, a framework in which you write the code once for me so that it can be run on all these different machines. But that, that does not come like that. You know, as I said, three lunch is over. So someone must have prepared the groundwork for the lunch to be not that costly. So I'll actually come to that. <clears throat> now, this is uh, Jim Stone's uh, sort of uh, timeline. And then there were other codes as well. Extremely competitive and very good codes too. Like Pluto, Ramses, and, you know, the Flash uh, from Chicago, actually, Andrea was in Flash group in, at the University of Chicago. Uh, so this like a, a close like, community, even if they have some different uh, users and uh, developers. So then Arivo came along. Then there is the smooth particle hydrodynamics, where you solve uh, hydrodynamics as if you're solving, you know, your flaws in particles. But you have to, like, you know, be more careful with that. It's the pressure gradient term. The, uh, so, they are absent from part of the analysis. Okay, so all these codes, like till five years ago, all these codes were MPI parallelized, extremely scalable on CPUs. CPUs are sort of really, very good. You know, they all have very similar sort of algorithms, very similar uh, capabilities, scaling, and so on. Awesome. And the nice thing about the public code is. That you're putting it out there. That means you are very confident that it gives the right answer and the answer that it is supposed to. You know, these are extremely well tested codes. A lot of magnified IE code in my group. It is very likely there are like a lot of bugs. But if you're making public, those bugs are common to be quickly fixed. There. So there is a great advantage of making your codes open as well. When you, you know, you suddenly find that there's a huge community out there waiting to sort of improve upon what you've done. Okay. So this was sort of the state. Now, most of these codes are still there. They're MPI, parallelized, like all kinds of things. Not a lot of them. They've taken the next step to go to these hybrid architectures to be able to use GPUs. Now, Frontier is there and all the clusters are ready to give you GPU hours for free. Now they have pressure to develop the next uh, generation of code which can go on exist scale. That's what Andrea said, right? Our top priority is to make Pluto exist scale ready, right? So that's where now everyone is doing this. Tina, KK, Tina, Tina, PK, all this is step toward that. Um, I have not heard of this from uh, Polka. Surprisingly, you know, it's someone who's extremely, uh, Polka Spring, you know, the, the Creator of uh, Gadget and a repo. So they don't have an accelerator plan yet, but you know, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, you have, in order to survive, you have to. Uh, uh, 
So yeah, so we have to be ready for that. Now, so I said there are different approaches, okay, and you have to use tools built by others in order to get into this game on a reasonable time scale. You cannot write code from scratch. There are so many things to be careful of. Okay. So this is the approach that the Tina group has taken, Jim Stone's Tina group has taken. So this is an example of one of those branches. This is this is a GitHub page. So it's on GitHub uh, of Athena PK, which is developed by this uh, someone called Phoenix Creator, who's at Hamburg in Germany. And this is based on something called Arthenon, which is an adaptive mesh refinement framework, which people at Sandia National Lab developed. So you are using tools by others and adopting them, adapting them for your own applications. It uses Cocos. So Cocos is a framework uh, in C++ which allows you to write a performance portable code. So the same code can, can run across architectures and the, the programmer has to just sort of write little code snippets which, which goes into this Cocos framework and you know it's converted into say if you have a GPU machine it will be converted into CUDA. If you have a, only CPU it will be converted into a code which the CPU understands. So this basically provides you a layer of software that hides the details of hardware from you the user. That work is done by these people who are developing tokens. So this is based at Sandia National Labs. In the US the national labs they have a like huge number of people who are really dedicated to developing software. Right? And a lot of this is open source software. So this is an example of that. So Athena PK, so this is about this uh, repo. Right? The performance portable version of Athena++ based on Parsimon and Cocos. <laughs> this is Cocos, uh, this is the Cocos readme page on, that's also on GitHub. Compose is also on GitHub. So this this read me page on GitHub. We sort of describe what this thing is. So Cocos code libraries. Cocos code implements the programming modules in C++ for writing performance portable applications targeting all major HPC platforms. For that purpose, it provides abstractions for both parallel execution and data management. Cocos is designed to target complex node architectures with n-level memory. Uh, memory hierarchy and multiple types of execution resources like GPU, CPU, accelerator, name it. It currently can use CUDA, SYCL, HPX, OpenMP, and C threads as backend uh, programming models and several other backends in development. So, this is one way of doing it. The other way is what Andrea was mentioning yesterday about that he's saying he's doing a rewrite. Are crucial based on uh, uh, open ACC directed, right? So that's slide from from his talk actually. Uh, so the high energy aspects is true. Uh, actually, does not mention that. It just sort of mentions that they have a second state machine, and that's what they're going to use. But I remember that they were using they were rewriting Pluto uh, to using open ACC directives so that it can be used on these accelerators. This is another approach. So this is actually I'm sort of coming to the end of my job. So I sort of briefly told you a little bit about the, the, the major milestones in the landscape of high performance computing and this about this beautiful website which actually presents data really really nicely. I really like that part of how that's how data is representing. Increasing fraction of hybrid architectures, future software must be that. Right, you know, this is there. Our software has to come up to speed in order to be able to use it. And we have been seeing things toward that. And this, in astrophysics, we have a great legacy of open codes. So you don't have to start from zero. Everyone does not have to start from zero, but everyone has to understand what they're doing. Okay, so that's why knowledge of HPC is extremely important, even if you're using open source codes. 
And as you said, as I mentioned, the approach is extremely multidisciplinary. That you you have to know a little bit of computer science, hardware, software, C plus plus, you know, this tool, you know, GitHub. So all these things are part of the toolkit of a modern HPC computational astrophysicists. Okay, and things are changing rapidly. <clears throat> so you know, uh, uh, Alankar covered a bit about a GitHub forking pull requests and concepts like this. You better know it. Especially you, you being from the younger generation, if you don't know this, uh, you're neither here nor there. Either you would you be as good as the analytics as the older people. So when you have your team, you're a mess, that's guaranteed. Because that was the only thing that they did. Right? You know? So you better be good at this aspect. Okay. Uh, and you have to adapt to change uh, with time. If you don't, then you know, you're like dinosaur. So this is the moment. And the stone age didn't end because they ran out of stones. Stones are still there. But as a result of competition from the bronze tools which met people's needs. And this is where young people come in. You know, we are in several our way, right? We are, we are used to whatever we are used to. But you should not mold yourself on people from your advisor's generation. No. You have to learn, and in fact, it should be the other way around. And I actually try to, but I don't know any of this. So I tell Pavanka, please, you tell, tell me. At least I should know qualitatively what it all means. So that's where the young people can lead us into a place where, you know, we can all combine our strengths and do good science. Okay, with that, I'll thank you and yeah. take questions. They wanted to ask that, uh, so we do promote. The static grid is within the parallel part is written in C and C++. Uh, but the AMR part that I have seen it is uh, it, it has included four terminals. But I actually don't know. I never use the I personally never use the AMR part of. I just wanted to ask. In many cases, they have used this every kind of thing. What is the use of four terminals? Sure, if they have used four terminal part. AMR part Combined chopo, you require uh, so sometimes what happens is that there are some legacy chops that run in other languages. Instead of converting them, they will still compile them. But right. uh, I think that the, now the newer course is one of the accessible faculty in their self sustaining. So I think we really want to put on the material and we are going to go the group towards the C. The whole course will now. That's why everyone is moving to C++ because that's where you get the capability to do all this. I mean, the thing has started with C, but now it's C++ and Andrea has moved to C++ as well. And that's how we are doing. Yeah, 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 that's how we are doing. Mention or this or the nursing system. See how chain happens. So, Andrea uh, wanted to do this GPU exercise, started to open ACC, Pluto code is public. So, someone downloaded the code, uh, Jeff or the Sue, who's actually a good friend of mine as well, and they used Cocos to parallelize like, a few code routines of it, and now they have a code. Which is actually called EGFX, very by X. Okay. So the thing is, there's also a risk to keep yourself on the loop. I think that risk is well worth it. It's not as if you know everything is gone. I mean, just run it. So they have used Cocos to create sort of like a, a parallel uh, CPU compatible version now. Um, yeah, so, yeah. so, apart from the sort of usual quantitative scaling this has been happening in terms of performance improvements, uh, have there been cases and do you expect more of these in the future where something just like, fun, like for example, using GPU architecture, that was something fundamentally different uh, in terms of coding practices and um, just writing structures. Do you think that there is going to be a... I am no expert. There are a lot of things happening, like there's this first 
then there's something called Chant plus plus and C plus plus. There's another framework which does this uh, task based parallelization. We have run of it a little bit. So, uh, Pradush was mentioning it that you know, you could really get, get the state ops. So, that's where coming together of computer scientists and application people is can be extremely powerful. Okay, but in, in terms of, I, I think this is the, the big thing. That is going to happen for the next decade. Like, like monthly calls was the big thing uh, from the time that I said, this is the next week. And of course, there are variants happening at the time. Okay.